Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, rather, sorry. <laughs> uh, just imagine the situation. I've got this brilliant idea for publishing a book. So I go on with my ideas to the local book publisher and tell him, all right, I've got an idea for a book. And he says, OK, what's this book about? And my reply is, well, it's a book different from any other. It's going to have lots of details from history in it. It's going to have social events mentioned in it. It's going to include poetry and some songs. And of course, it's got to have some love stories in it. And also, it will deal with wars and conflicts. And there will always be betrayal and intrigue in a book like this. And I'm going to throw in, for good measure, predictions about the future. OK, he says, looking a bit puzzled. Uh, OK, who's going to actually do the writing of this? Well, I'm not going to do it myself, I'd say. I've got 40 different people lined up. And uh, he then begins to frown. Where do they live? Well, they're about a 1,000 miles apart. And in fact, they're not all alive at the same time. They've, some of them are already dead. And they've uh, spanned a period of 1,500 years. And, uh, but all this is, means that I'm going to have just one author, even though I have 40 different writers. And I'm going to have the same consistent message. Now, any publisher who is seen uh, to tackle that sort of scenario uh, is going to be very wary indeed. And it would be a publisher's nightmare. And I think that if I went with that suggestion, this is what would happen to me. I'd be shown the door as fast as possible. However, such a book as that does exist. And it is the Bible. And here it is. The Bible has 66 different books to it. And yet they are all one complete, consistent message. There's even two halves to the Bible. An Old Testament with 39 books and the New Testament with 27 books. And to put that sort of writing together would be a publisher's nightmare. But the Bible exists, and not only that, it's a publishing success, because it's the most widely circulated book in the entire world. So far, over 6,000 million Bibles have been printed. And every year, more than 22 million copies of the entire Bible and New Testament are circulated around the globe. So it's the world's best-selling book. And no wonder, because the claims of the Bible are outstanding. Here in 2 Timothy 3, talking about itself, it says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So we have to see the hand of God behind the existence of this miraculous book, the Bible. If we look back into history, we find that it's a book which, down the ages, has been translated into all sorts of different languages. Uh, 500 years ago, it was available in about 14 languages in the world. 100 years later, it had been translated into a few more in about 40 different languages. By the 1800s, it was 72 languages. But by 1900, it had been translated into 567 different languages. And by 1937, the thousand language mark had been reached. And by 1970, the 1500 different language mark had been reached. And by the year 2000, it was well over 2000 different languages, at least for partial translations. Now, uh, currently, Bible translators are working on another additional 1,000 languages. Now, I didn't know there were that many languages in the world, but I believe, believe there are, and the Bible has been translated into many of them and is available in those languages for people to read themselves. However, you might say, OK, well, this is a book which is very different from any other. What is it? What is the Bible? And the simple answer is it's God's message to the world and it's God's plan for this world on which we live. And outlined in one of the early books is that plan that all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. That's the ultimate purpose of God revealing his plan to us, 
in this miraculous book. Now, the Bible is one complete story, one complete record of the history of mankind. And it is absolutely miraculous when you think that it was written over a 1,500-year period. It was written over 40 generations by over 40 different writers. And the writers weren't people who normally wrote books about other topics. They came from all kinds of backgrounds. Some were kings, some were peasants, some were philosophers, some were fishermen, some were poets, statesmen, scholars, you name it. They came from that kind of background. And there's a record of at least one of them who says he was compelled to write the words of God, even though he was just a shepherd. It was written in many different places around the Middle East, yet the whole of that Bible is one complete miraculous message. And once read, it becomes obvious that it is one in message, it is one in principle, and it is one in purpose. And the purpose that it reveals is God's plan and purpose with this very earth on which we live. And that message is that there is a single gospel of salvation right from the start, right to the end of this amazing book. So here's a book which, as I've said, would be a publisher's nightmare, but God has brought it into existence, and in it he gives a consistent view of his wonderful plan for the world. Of course, people have come along and have said, okay, well, the Bible is an old book, therefore it's got to have lots of errors in it, being translated and, and copied many times down the ages. Do you have a perfect Bible, you might say? Well, if you were to look at how the Bible was copied down the ages, you find some very amazing rules and regulations were made. Now, the Old Testament was copied by hand because this was long, long before the days of printing presses. Printing presses didn't come along until the 15th century after Christ. So when we're talking about years BC, every single copy of the Old Testament had to be handwritten. And people devoted their whole lifetime to doing this. And it was mainly copied by people who were Jews and had the particular job of being a scribe. And here's some of the rules they had. And they were very, very fussy. Uh, for example, you could only use clean animal skins. No, no paper as we understand it in those days. They were animal skins, parchments, that kind of thing. They could write on them. They even had to bind the manuscripts. Every column had to have no less than 48 and no more than, uh, no less than 48 and no more than 60 lines. And the ink had to be a special formula. And there were more rules as these scribes copied these precious scriptures by hand. They had to wipe the pen and wash their entire bodies before writing the word Lord every time they wrote it. That was okay if you had one occurrence of the word Lord in a chapter, but if you had one which had almost every verse beginning with the word Lord, then you did a lot of washing in those days. And uh, there was also a review of what you'd written within 30 days. And if any, there were any as much as three pages required corrections, then that manuscript was thrown away and had to be redone. And they had to say aloud each word as they wrote it. And the letters and the words and the uh, paragraphs had to be uh, counted, and the document became invalid if two letters touched each other because they could get confused with the letters. So the middle paragraph, the word and letter, would correspond to those of the original document. It was a, a copy as best they could of the original they were working from, and they could only be stored in sacred places like synagogues. And any document which contained the word Lord, the name of God, had to be stored or buried in one side. You couldn't tear it up or burn it because it contained the precious word Lord. And they were kept hidden in what's known as a geniza, meaning a hiding place in Hebrew. So those were the rules, and they're amazing rules. Imagine having to follow those sorts of rules on a daily basis, and the work that you'd spent days doing just because you'd made one error was suddenly thrown out. But you see, those rules 
preserve the accuracy of the Old Testament. So when we say, do you have a perfect Bible? We have to answer, yes, as far as we can determine it, we have. And it's amazing that this discovery, the Dead Sea Scrolls, has proved to us that these scribes who spent a whole lifetime copying the Bibles, the Old Testament, did a really good job, they followed the rules, and they made very, very few mistakes. The Dead Sea Scrolls were an amazing discovery. They were sets of scrolls of the Bible, the Old Testament. Um, they were hidden in earthenware jars in a place near the Dead Sea, hence the term Dead Sea Scrolls. And they've been preserved there for almost 2,000 years. They're almost 2,000 years old and discovered in 1947. So you almost had a, like a, a buried time capsule. You know, nowadays, people, you know, the children at school will, will put a, a lot of objects and writings into a, a container and bury it in the ground as a time capsule for somebody to dig up in X number of years' time. Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls were just that. They've been left in these caves for a long, long time. So here is the time we have uh, about 500 AD, is the, the, last com the, the earliest completed uh, Old Testament, around about 500 BC. The Old Testament was complete by about 460 BC, just after 500 BC. So when you got to the, the time of the Lord Jesus, uh, time passed and they were working on these Old Testament uh, scrolls but they the oldest copies we have until 1947 of anything from the Old Testament was uh, about 1000 AD these were the earliest copies we had of anything relating to the Bible older than that there were no originals yet the Dead Sea Scrolls point to that time the time of the Lord Jesus Christ and we can have a little chain, a comparison of changes. And there is no change. The, the number of errors are, are virtually insignificant between what existed in the time of the Lord Jesus and what had been copied for a thousand years and no mistakes have been made. So here in uh, the place of the Dead Sea Scrolls, it was here in the north end of the Dead Sea, a place called Qumran, uh, where these scrolls were found. So the data tells us that 93% of the texts are identical and 95% uh, of the texts are identical with only minor variations. Uh, and uh, that is an amazing record of how well these scribes have done in copying by hand these books from the Old Testament. But we say the Bible's divided into two halves. And the books of the New Testament is the second half of the Bible. And there are the books down the left-hand side there. Matthew and the other three Gospel writers ending with the book of Revelation. And this records to us the life of the Lord Jesus and what happened uh, after he was raised to life again and how Christianity spread throughout the Israel and the Middle East. But when was the New Testament completed? We said the Old Testament was complete by about 460 BC. Now, what about the New Testament? Well, you can look at um, um, records of what we've got. In fact, the New Testament is the best documented ancient manuscript we have of any book anywhere in the world. There are about 25,000 pieces or scraps of New Testament copies dating back to uh, very, very early times. And it far outweighs any of the traditional writings of anybody else, like Homer's Iliad and things like that. So the New Testament manuscripts that we have are numerous, and they agree almost 100%. But also, there are other books written which were written in the centuries after the New Testament was complete, which give a, a summary of the teaching of the New Testament and how it was put into practice. And uh, therefore, these books which are written by other people can actually help us to support the evidence that this is what the New Testament was like in its very early days. These early church fathers quoted from it, and so we know that that was a document 
in circulation at their time. Now we read as an introduction, 2 Peter chapter 3. And this is that uh, phrase here from the English Standard Version. Here are the verses here. And what Peter is doing is talking about the writings of the Apostle Paul. You see, Paul wrote some of the letters of the New Testament, in fact, most of them. Peter wrote a couple of them, and uh, one or two others wrote one or two other of the letters in the New Testament. But when Peter wrote his letter, second letter, in the mid-60s, that's about 34 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, then notice what he says about Paul's letters. He says, Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters, when he speaks in them of these matters. Some are things in, some are, there are some things in them that are hard to understand. Yeah, and we'd echo that, wouldn't we? Paul's letters do have things which are sometimes hard to understand. But notice he says, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. Now, the implication of that is amazing. Because Peter here is saying that by the time he wrote those words, then Paul's letters were part of the scriptures. They were already accepted as part of the New Testament and already accepted, therefore, as part of God's holy word, the Bible. So Paul's letters must have been widely in circulation by the time Peter wrote this, and he tells them, classifies them as scriptures, and the year he was writing that was something like AD 64. Now that's amazing, isn't it? That within 34 years of the death and resurrection of Jesus, all these letters have been put together and the New Testament is almost complete. Now in the New Testament, there was a, an awful event happened. It happened in the year 70, about six years after Peter wrote those words I've just had on the screen. And what happened was the equivalent of our 9-11. Now, I'm sure that we all remember exactly what happened when those planes hit the World Trade Center on the 11th of September in 2001. We can probably even remember what we were doing because that was an event which shook the world, not just because of what happened that day, but because of what happened afterwards and the consequences of that day. Well, there was a 9-11 in the first century. It was this, in AD 70, when the Jewish temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in a horrific way and Jerusalem was captured. The Romans did it. The Romans invaded it. And after a siege of five months, they got inside the city and burnt the temple down. Now, that event was a major catastrophe, just like 9-11 was for us. And the history of that event and the record of it would echo throughout the Roman world. Everybody knew about it because it was so awful, it was so devastating, and uh, it stood out as a landmark in the history of time. But that echoed then throughout the whole Roman world and its details were known everywhere. So why do we find no mention of it in the New Testament as history? There's no mention whatsoever of AD 70 happening as a historical event in any of the writings of the New Testament. And uh, there is prophecy about what would happen. Jesus foretold the events in AD 70, and that's there. But there's no record of it happening as a recorded historical event. Now, really, there's only one answer to that, and that's this, that when the writings of the New Testament were written, that event had not happened, else it surely would have been mentioned. Even now, people mention 9-11, and we're now 15 years after the event. But in the first century, in the Bible, nothing at all as in terms of history. Now, another thing as well, when you think of the New Testament, is that the Apostle John, who is considered to be the latest of the Old Testament writers, he mentions things to do with Jerusalem. In fact, he mentions features in Jerusalem which were destroyed in AD 70, 
So, for example, in John 5, verse 2, he particularly mentions a, uh, a pool which has colonnades and a porch. Now, in AD 70, those were destroyed. But he says quite clearly in John 5, verse 2, that there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. Now, that to me says that when John wrote those words, those porches, those colonnades were still there, and the pool of Bethesda was still there, and Jerusalem hadn't been destroyed by the Romans. So when John wrote those words, his gospel, it was before the events of AD 70. So John wrote before AD 70. And uh, there's one or two other things like that in his gospel. In fact, as you look through the records of history in the, in the gospels, you find these records of what happened, what took place, but no mention of AD 70, because when they wrote those words, it hadn't happened. And so the writers all wrote those words within 40 years of the death and resurrection of Jesus. And you also find that John in particular fills in details about events which have taken place after the event he's talking about when he's doing his writing. So, for example, he mentions, uh, put the passages up now, uh, John 11 and John 2. Here's John 11. It's coming up on screen now. And he says, this is what John says in John 11. He says, it's when Jesus was, the, the authorities were planning to put him to death. And uh, the high priest says, you don't understand that it's better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. But then, then John continues. He says, he didn't say this of his own accord, but being high priest, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And he continues, not for that nation only, but also that he might gather into one the children of God who were scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Now, those events in yellow hadn't happened at the time Jesus was uh, crucified. They happened much, much later. John is talking about the calling of the Gentiles, and that began to happen about 15 years after the death of the Lord Jesus. But you see, John's writing this at a later point in time, so he records what's happened since the death and resurrection of Jesus, which he's mentioning in the context there. Now, when John records in John chapter 2 about Jesus talking of the temple, he says it's taken 46 years to build this temple. Will you raise it up in three days? That's what the Jews say to Jesus. And then John puts his comments in. He was speaking about the temple of his body. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered these things. So John says that, you know, a few years later, three years later, Jesus rose to life, and the disciples remembered it. But what John doesn't say, which would be the ideal place to put it, is, and that temple which Jesus spoke about was destroyed by the Emperor Vespasian many years later. No, no mention at all. Yet John's the man who fills in the historical details, and he doesn't mention it. So you put that with all the other evidence, and the only conclusion you come to is that John wrote those words before AD 70. And uh, the whole testament, therefore, including all the writings of John, must have been completed before AD 70. So that's how we can look at the datings in the Bible, because people have tried to criticize the New Testament and say it took at least 100 years for it to come together. But if you look at the internal evidence about what these writers wrote about and what they didn't write about, you've only got one conclusion, that they wrote before AD 70 when Jerusalem was destroyed. So then, if you come back to the Bible, we've got uh, the whole of the Bible like a jigsaw, the Old and the New Testaments all fitting together, telling us about the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament, what he would do, prophesying the things he would do. The New Testament telling us what he did and what he will do in the future. The, as a point of interest, we now have chapters in our Bibles. But in the Old Testament, they didn't have chapters. Uh, 
or verses. The chapters were first put in the Bible a long time after the Bible was first finished because this was around in the, the middle of the 13th century when Stephen Langdon, Archbishop of Canterbury, decided to put chapters in to make it easy to reference. And the first English Bible, which was handwritten by John Wycliffe and published in 1382, was the first Bible ever to have chapters in it. And it was a little while later when verses came on the scene. And the count goes that in 1551, uh, a famous English printer, Robert St Stevens, was riding on horseback to, uh, from Switzerland to France, and whilst he was riding on horseback, he was dividing the chapters up into verses, and he produced a series of verses. That's why, riding on horseback, perhaps some of the verses aren't in the right places. The verse divisions are in the wrong positions. But nevertheless, his is the one that's been accepted. And the Bible published in 1560, known as the Geneva Bible, was the very first Bible to be printed which had chapters and verses. So now you can say, well, John 3 verse 16 says this. We couldn't before that day, not before 1560. It wasn't possible. So that's just a, a sideline, but it's an amazing detail, really, when you think about it. You can ask the question, all right, what's in the Bible? It tells us what's happened in the past, not just as a historical event, but it tells us why it happened. It explains the current situation we're in today, and it shows us what the future will be like. And the Bible says, don't ignore me. Don't bury your head in the sand like the ostrich because this is a message of hope and a message of salvation. But you might ask the question, well, okay, with the Bible with 66 books in it, how do we know that we've got the entire amount that we should have? How do we know that none have been missed out? Or how do we know we haven't got too many? And the answer is, God in the Old Testament, in the time the second book was being penned, decided to give us a pattern of what his Bible would be like. And he did it in this form. In the, uh, there was in the place of worship called the tabernacle, which they were instructed to build, God gave them a design for a golden lampstand. And it had various features on it. It, had a, it was, in effect, a seven-branch lampstand with seven lights on it. But each of the branches had various features. They were known as um, buds, and almonds and flowers. And uh, altogether, when you count up the number of features, there were exactly 66 different features in that lampstand. And here is that which represented the word of God, giving light to the tabernacle, just as God's word in the Bible gives light to the world. So how many features did it have? 66. How many parts does the Bible have? 66. Yet, there's a wonderful description of it. In Exodus 37, it's, this lampstand is, is described as the whole of it is a single piece of hammered work of pure gold. Even though it has 66 features in it, it was all one work. It was all one thing. It was all one unit. And the same is absolutely true of the Bible. It has 66 features, 66 books, but they're all part of one complete unison. That's why when God put this design in place, in the very earliest days of recorded history in the Bible, he outlined what his final product would be like. And when this was penned around about 1400 years before Christ, then there was no Bible in existence. The only writings they had were Genesis and Exodus and parts of Leviticus that they did at that time. So in the very earliest stages of writing the Bible, God showed us what his finished product would be like, which would come into realization at least 1,500 years later. And that shows us why the Bible has everything we need. It's the truth, it's the whole truth, 
It's nothing but the truth. Nothing's missed out. Nothing's been added. It's all there. That's why we say it's a miracle, and it's the miracle of the Bible. Thank you.